So I have the luck again to talk to you after lunch in the darkness. So <laughs> please bear with me. Hopefully I can make this sufficiently exciting that you will follow through. Um, I'll try. <clears throat> I have a lot of things to say and I have less time now than previously. So I might go a little bit fast, but let me know if I'm going too fast. And uh, hopefully that will perhaps keep you up to speed. So today I'm going to talk to you about the application of what I talked about last Tuesday. And with uh, Arnold Heyer, we're interested in looking at how endothelial cell migration happens and how the actomyosin networks remodel as the cells migrate. And we're going to talk a little bit about myosin dynamics and endothelial cells. And with Paul, mostly what I have been working on is developing a software to be able to apply sticks um, on, in live cells in a very intuitive way. And my interest lies in the intersection of these three areas of biology, image analysis, and complex systems. So I'll tell you about an example of photosome dynamics. This is work of my, my PhD, which I'm currently doing. So most of the things that you're going to see today are not published yet. So please don't take pictures. <laughs> and hopefully, I will ever one day be able to publish all of this. And then I will be able to share the papers with you. So first of all, I'm going to talk about myosin dynamics using sticks. And for those of you who are not so familiar with acting cytoskeleton, the cytoskeleton uh, is in continuous remodeling in the front with la um, lamellar protrusions of um, branched actin that in other places of the cell can also form bundles and contracting fibers. And what we uh, are looking at or what we're interested in in particularly is on myosin 2, which forms these bundles that accumulate along the fibers. What this looks like in a more molecular way is that non-muscle myosin, when it's uh, inactive, is kind of in this circular shape. And when it opens, when it's phosphorylated and therefore uh, activated, it opens up like this. And then this part, the coil coil domain, can form bundles between each other. And they end up like flower bouquets on both sides of it. More or less around 50 molecules of myosin bundled together to form this. And what we have done is that we have labeled this re uh, re regulatory leg chain. And so all of the flowers, let's say, on each side of these bundles are labeled and visible. This um, uh, myosin. Uh, bundles accumulate in, uh, in a dynamic fashion in the near the cell edge regulated by MLCK and near the cell interior by ROC, which is the target of the drug that Michelle was telling us about. So uh, by, uh, reg by the regulation, they start forming these uh, start small bundles and they then align. And what this looks like in super resolution is that they have uh, realized that this looks like a dumbbell uh, um, for configuration uh, in this, in this uh, schematic. And that they have also observed, uh, uh, other researchers have observed that this is stacked sometimes on top of each other. And sometimes they exchange members of the fiber. So there's kind of like untangling and re-entangling between these. So what I am interested in is looking at this myosin puncta in a more dynamic way. So this is the same video, just at two different speeds, in which you can see how the myosin dots are formed as the cell protrudes. And they started experiencing this retrograde flow. At the same time that in other regions, these dots eventually form these fibers that contract in different parts of the cell. So this, to me, seemed to be like a very uh, appropriate example of something that would be fixable uh, in the sense that I could calculate what is the flow the, uh, direction of these regions. Um, inconvenient of the lysosomes containing M cherry marks, which still survive. So these vesicles caused me a lot of headaches, but still I was able to extract the flow on other parts of the cell. Now, what we're interested in is not only how the myosin moves, and you can see that there are different spatiotemporal dynamics. If you squint a little bit on this uh, movie on the right, you can see that there is some diffuse cloud propagation of myosin activity, and myosin intensity is uh, proportional to its accumulation there. And this is driven by rho GTPases. So in another project, which I will not have time to talk to you about, I am trying to apply sticks not only to the displacement of matter, but this time to the displacement of rho activity and how the signaling uh, mechanisms or how the signaling molecules try propagate across the cell as this move. And how does this have a correlation between the fret activity of uh, the fret channel of rho activity and the myosin accumulation intensity and displacement? So that will be for another time. But for today, I'm just going to show you an example of a cell that is migrating more or less in a persistent way. And you can see how it forms new myosin puncta at the front and how the fibers in the back start to contract and accumulate. And by applying sticks, we can characterize the flow in each of the regions of the cell. And this is more or less what that looks like. So you have each vector represents a region of interest on which we applied sticks. 
And we can calculate what direction and velocity the, the myosin puncta flow is moving like, at, as well as looking at the edge dynamics over that period of time. Now, this cell is moving around just um, autonomously in any direction, but sometimes we need to kind of reduce the complexity to be able to establish a front and back to the cell. And we do that using micro patterning. So instead of the channels that we talked about earlier this morning, in this case, this is a pattern of fibronectin. So the cell is only able to adhere in this region of fibronectin. And you can see how that re results in a very directed movement. Worth of notice is that um, this cell is uh, attached to another cell that is ahead of it. And it's kind of trailing ahead uh, behind it, following its, its steps. So what I'm interested in is characterizing how myosin flow happens at the front and the back of the cell, how these foci of, or sinks in which uh, myosin accumulates very rapidly are formed, and whether these are important or determinant for high uh, persistence and high efficient uh, uh, cell migration. So by applying sticks to a small regions of interest inside of this map of myosin, I'm able to generate a very dense map of vectors. So each of these tiny colorful dots are a vector of different velocities. And you can see the magnitude of the velocities in this other map. And similar to the eccentricity, which um, um, Lionel showed us, you can also extract the angle at which these uh, molecules are migrating. So in purple and blue, you can see the things that are moving downwards. And in green and yellow, you would see things that are moving upwards. And you can see waves of uh, retrograde flow uh, in the in the front as the cell kind of like pulls on itself towards the front. Um, I am still working on uh, getting a more detailed and more high resolution version of this approach. And I'll show you some of the ca challenges that I have encountered. But one of the things that I am very interested in is also correlating how this myosin flow is uh, related with the edge velocity. So this is just the edge velocity of five uh, consecutive frames over time, and I developed a new method by which we can convert this mask of uh, edge, uh, the cell edge into a vector field in which we can calculate quantitatively how quickly and in what orientation are the cells moving. So we can quantify protrusion and retraction speeds, magnitude, span, etc. cetera. Um, now, one of the challenges is that when I do epifluorescence, as one of you, some of you mentioned, I have light in and out of the focus. So this is the original version. So I came up with an algorithm that allows me to distinguish the clouds that I showed you before from the dots that I'm interested in. So to do that, I had like two iterations of it. And the first version was very rough. But in the second one, you can see how we gain a little bit of definition in the front and the back of the cell as this punct move, regardless of how much diffuse myosin I have in that region. So kind of untangling the, the waves um, uh, from the clouds. And what we can do using image correlation spectroscopy is to characterize the fiber orientation and the fiber um, persistence or yeah, the, the, the eccentricity, let's say, of the correlation function. Because if we look at this specific region in the first couple of frames, we have a very clear uh, um, horizontal feature and which the correlation function looks something like this, and the fit can look something like this. In this case, it's a, a very symmetrical one, but it can be also rotated with a given angle. And if I extract the eccentricity and the orientation of this angle, then I, I can characterize in which parts of the image I have fibers and what orientation they are in, what angle they're at. And because I have the sticks uh, information of the flow, then I can also determine the puncta that are on the fiber are moving at which speed on top of the fiber, and how much is the fiber moving laterally from one place to another. Hopefully that will be done soon. <laughs> um, but the other thing that I wanted to mention is we can then have in the mask of the cell some information, in the myosin function, in the myosin channel, uh, some other qualitative information, but applying the, the um, uh, algorithm that I showed you before, I get a much be, uh, clearer determination of what in puncta are. And the big advantage of this algorithm is that it allows us to pick up puncta where the image is very, very dim, regardless of the global intensity profile of the image. Um, uh, additionally, I also develop a new algorithm to, correct, to quantify the convexity and concavity of the cell edge to see how much the cell is ruffled and how much the cell is uh, protruding or retracting regarding to that. So this is about the myosin, and I want to talk to you a little bit also about another project which has fortunately been uh, published now. So this is about collective photosome dynamics. And yesterday at the beginning of the talk, I talked, I told you that I really am interested in collective phenomena. So um, as I said, this, this paper, I'm very happy that it came out uh, in Nature Communications recently. So I'm very happy 
that I got the opportunity to work with these folks. And I have to give credit to Zhe Gong from the USA, now in China, and Vivek Chinoy from the USA in Pennsylvania, who worked with Kuhn van den Dries, who uh, acquired most of the data, and Alessandra Cambi in the Netherlands, experts in photosums. And Paul and me were invited to this co collaboration because they were using sticks to quantify how photosome dynamics occur in immune cells. But to begin with, what are even photosomes? Photosomes look something like this. There are these tiny dots at the bottom of the cells. And what they do is that they're acting uh, rich structures that are mechanosensitive. So we talked a little bit about how important the stiffness of the substrate is for cells. They are used by immune cells of the monocytic, monocytic myeloid lineage. So that means monocytes, macrophages, and detritic cells to probe their environment and see how much the stiffness it resists their pushing and generate forces and pro patrol for different antigens. They have a polarized distribution in migrating cells and they have been found to be more often in the front of the cells. They're more or less 500 micro nanometers wide and one micron in depth, and they're very short lifetime. So they are, have a very fast um, the rate, uh, rate, let's say, or time lifetime. Um, and they have a camping stand structure. What that looks like is something like this. You have the strings or the cords that are pulling the core in the center, and the core has this actin uh, center that is polymerizing towards the bottom, and it's continuously pushing down. So what called our attention about photosomes is that they exhibit what we call a, a collective behavior. And this is somewhat visible, perhaps, in this data in which you have a cell marked with a uh, life act, and you can see the actin structure of each of these photosomes that appear and disappear in different regions of the cell. Some of them move a little bit laterally, but what is uh, more important or interesting in this particular case is how the intensity of each of these photosomes fluctuates in time and how the neighbor's photosome intensity fluctuates with respect to this one. So perhaps in this uh, fast uh, version of this movie, it's a little bit clearer to see that in this region, there's a high intensity of, of, act, of actin and it propagates towards this arc region of the edge of the cell. And this has been reported previously that there is some correlation between adjacent photosomes, but the mechanism by which they're coupled was not clearly understood. We knew that there was some sort of way that they were talking to each other and propagating these waves, but we didn't quite know exactly why or how. Or how. And this is in a short scale, so these are minutes and seconds, but if you wait long enough, the cells not only generate photosomes that have fluctuating intensities, but they also start forming photosomes one after the other and form these waves of not only intensity, but presence and absence of photosomes. And in a very long uh, spatiotemporal uh, sense, it looks incredible, or at least to me, when I saw this, I was mesmerized and I was pretty impressed by how the cells were able to generate these photosome waves, which have some excitable aspect to them. If you look at it like in the, <laughs> firework version of this or a temporal uh, uh, color coded, you can see how these photosomes follow like a front of a wave one after the other. And we believe that these photosomes kind of direct the migration of the cell. So we want to understand what is the effect of small scale temporal dynamics with long term dynamics and how this differs in uh, cells that are able to patrol uh, appropriately and cells that are in, in, incapable of doing so. So the paper that I, uh, that I uh, was able to participate in focused on the modeling of how, what could be a model that could recapitulate what we observe. And what they did is this camping structure, they modeled it in a mathematical way, having forces that pulled the core to, towards the bottom at the same time that we have forces of actin that protrude and push the membrane down on the floor or on the substrate. And they have, of course, a, a resisting force against them. And the, um, the, the mechanism by which this happens is that actin in a G form, a monomeric form, comes in and gets incorporated into this protrusive. And just like a rocket that would be tied by strings that are elastic, the core will, push, will be pushed up by the resistance of the, of the substrate. At the same time, that, that increase in tension leads to now a recruitment via rho GTPA uh, signaling to more myosin binding and strengthening of these strings. So the more the, the potosome grows, the more the strength that it's being pulled down. And so the, uh, the actin polymerization here eventually collapses and it brings it all down. And so this is what we um, uh, propose here, explains the oscillation of the potosome intensity. So what we had to do first was to demonstrate that this mathematical model would work. So here you have potosome height simulation. So this is kind of like the fertility map of if a potosome were to be in this location, what is its potential to be high or low? 
And at the beginning, the model starts from random uh, values. And eventually, as time goes by, there starts to be a correlation and a propagation of where the photosomes can be high and where they can be low. This is, of course, the, the layer that we cannot see. What we experimentally see is just the actin photosomes going up and down. And what uh, I did is that I applied sticks to these particular uh, example. Oops. Oh. Okay, there we go. And um, I was able to characterize how the potosome uh, height would move uh, from one place to another. And you can notice a couple of things. One is that we have a margin because the first the region of interest is more or less this size. So the first vector that I can place is in the center of that region of interest. And the other thing is that if my region of interest is not sufficiently big in some regions where the intensity is kind of flat, then I cannot generate a, a vector sufficiently because I have a very small region of interest, so I don't have a very big dif di uh, difference in the gradient. Now, what it, when it gets very, really more interesting is when we apply this to actual cellular potosome height. So this is the same video that I showed before and the fast uh, red version of it. But so what we wanted to characterize how, was how this actin intensity propagated in space, and STIX is designed to capture the movement of it. So if I try to apply it directly to the signal, I would quantify how quickly these photosomes are moving laterally. But this is just because of how they get reorganized, right? So that is not exactly what I wanted to study. So the very simple and yet I think useful approach that I took is that I simply blurred the image. And by blurring the image, now I can see a little bit better how this intensity is propagating in space. And I directly applied sticks to this uh, uh, Gaussian filtered version and then overlaid what the, potosome, what the vectors look like on top of the original potosome to make sure that I was actually capturing what I wanted. And this is, of course, many different frames. And I take every time just five frames, right? So this is what it looks like when I try to validate over those five frames. This is the vector field that gets generated over those five frames. And you can perhaps see that the intensity that it starts here propagates towards these edges, or the intensity that was here propagates upwards towards this direction. And it's not really the movement of the potosomes itself. It's just that the potosomes that are here from the beginning, they just started to become more bright as the, at the same time that these ones became dimmer. So once I validated this approach, I was able to uh, apply it to different frames of uh, all of the data set and to generate this maps in which you can see now how the dynamics happen over, over a, very, a longer time scale. And hopefully this plays. If I have the chance, I will show it to you another time. But the main take home message is that because the sticks can be um, simply considering the image, uh, the, the spatial temporal relationships of an image with respect to, each other, to another in a same place or in a different place, it can be used not to only scan, quantify spatial information, diffusion coefficient maps, flow, but even some other mechanisms and some other, whenever there is a correlation of something, of an image pattern in one region with respect to another. So with that, I'll just summarize uh, a little bit of what I uh, talked to you yesterday about the software development of this graphical user interface. It's kind of similar to a Monopari plugin and um, the Myosin dynamics that I talked to you today and the Purusom dynamics at the end. And it's stuck again, but the next one is just thank you. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you uh, to Lionel and to Enrico and to everyone. And thank you all for bearing with me. It has been really nice.